right, good morning. Hey, before we go any further, I feel like the Lord laid something on my heart and uh, just felt like we were supposed to do this publicly. Um, is Emily Silguero in here? Where's Emily? Somebody get Emily. Sorry, Em, come on out here. You can come over and stand by David for just a moment. You're not in trouble. <laughs> um, I know that Emily wouldn't be the only one that experiences this, but I felt like uh, I was just supposed to declare this, pray this over her, and uh, then maybe just pray it over all of us. Man, Emily, I know that uh, the things that God has called y'all to, um, it's felt like, and actually has been real, you've had to give up a lot, and you've had to delay things, and um, yeah, just really real big life ticket items, right? You've, you've had to give up and delay for the calling of the Lord on your life. Um, but the lie of the enemy is that it's a bad exchange, because the truth is, whatever we give up for the Lord, we're going to get way more in return. And the lie that the, that the enemy likes to speak over our lives, especially when we're trying to really serve the Lord, is like, man, if I give this up, no matter what it is, if I give this up, you know, I'm just going to be with, I'm going to be without. Anytime we give up anything for the Lord, guys, we're going to get so much more back. And this is what scripture teaches. So I want to declare just over your mind and your heart, Emily, that when the devil comes and lies to you and says you're having to give up all this stuff, that um, you would tell him he's a liar, you'd kick him in the mouth, and you would receive the truth of the Lord. Um, God, I thank you, Lord, for the courage that Emily walks in, the boldness to say yes to you to really crazy things, Lord. Um, God, and right now we just speak peace and truth over her mind, and we declare it is a lie that if we give up for you, we're going to do without, because the truth is we're going to get so much more in return from you, Lord. So we bless her, and Lord, anyone in here that feels that way right now, we bless them, and when they start to feel that, God, we pray that you would quicken their mind and their heart, and they would remember, no, this isn't true. This is a lie. I'm getting back so much more in the Lord. And we bless you, God. We thank you that your love is so much bigger than any lie from the enemy. And we say these things in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, guys, why don't you turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 2. We are in a series going through the book of Acts, and so again, I think this is three weeks in. We're not necessarily going verse by verse or chapter by chapter, but we're, we're hitting some really big moments uh, in the book of Acts, and we're still just towards the beginning. Um, you know, the book of Acts gives us more information. It, it brings the Holy Spirit to the forefront uh, more than any other book, right? It, the, the, the book of Acts talks about the Holy Spirit, um, part of the Trinity. He is God, right, more than any other book in the Bible. And it really just um, shows us what, what the church is meant to look like when it's yielded and surrendered to the Holy Spirit. Last week, um, and I also want to say, like, each one of these messages really builds upon another. I kind of feel like if you just take what I'm saying today without last week, then it maybe won't make full sense. So I encourage you to go back and listen to last week's message. Um, but last week we began to talk about the importance of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, or whatever term you want to use, being filled with the Spirit, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So we're talking about the importance of this, and I really want to define it as this. Um, when we say being filled by the Holy Spirit or being baptized in the Holy Spirit, what we're saying is being absolutely led and empowered by God through the Holy Spirit. So you're being led and empowered um, to be a witness for Christ. And God has called us to be a witness for Christ, but he never wanted us to do it in our own power. He wanted to fill us with his spirit in order to do it. Now, what does it look like to be a witness? So I'm going to tell you several different things, then we'll read some scriptures. Um, if we really want to win people to Jesus, here are some things the Bible talks about, and I think we could relate with as truth. Um, power, right? Power is one of these things. The power of God showing up and loving someone. The power of God shows up by by happens by God answering someone's prayers or God being there or healing happened or a sign and a wonder, a miracle, right? So the power of God is something we see in Scripture and is something there still for today. 
Um, we see and we read in the scripture that the, that the filling of the Spirit produces boldness in a believer because as we yield to him, man, we, we get bold to go out and share the truth, to share the gospel. So being a witness looks like boldness. But what about kindness? Couldn't being a witness look like kindness? Look like love? Look like faith and trust when things seem impossible, like standing and saying, man, God's going to do this. And then people see him do it. What about peace when you're, going through, when you're going through a trial? What about the world seeing us like, man, how does this guy have this peace that doesn't make any sense? Guys, I believe that being filled with the Spirit is absolutely empowerment to walk in signs and wonders and boldness. But I believe it's also, and I'll bring these together in a little bit, I believe it's also the empowerment to walk in forgiveness, to walk in gentleness, to walk in peace, to walk in love. This being consumed with the Spirit of God is Him manifesting all these things, and these things produce a witness. We live in a world that's corrupt and that's messed up, and the world is actually looking for this. And we have what the world needs through the Holy Spirit. And so we've got to press into it. So Acts chapter 2, verse 42. Uh, we're going to read this again. We've read it every week, but I'm going to read about uh, five or six verses here. And it says, they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. They were continually, on an ongoing basis, devoting themselves to these things. We're going to read in a minute that, that because of this, or because of part of this, guys, they were a witness. People were getting added to the church daily, right? And it says here, one of the things is they were devoted to prayer. I just want to say this from a personal standpoint. Um, man, Wednesday night prayer right now, and I think we've been doing it four weeks now. I can say this honestly. This isn't like some like promo, like trying to get you to come. I told my wife this when we left Wednesday night. Man, it's become my favorite moment of the week. Because the sweetness of the fellowship and the prayer that's happening is, it just... I mean, I just leave so, I mean, I know you're kind of tired, 6.30 rows around, but you leave here and you just feel so encouraged. And why? Well, we're just being devoted to what the Bible lays out for us. And man, it is so encouraging. I don't ask you to come because we want another number there. I ask you to come because it'll change your life. Um, verse 43, everyone kept feeling a sense of awe. That's what, I mean, that's, that's a witness, right? If people walk in, they're just like, Oh my goodness, there's something going on here. God is in this place. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe. And many, not just a few, many wonders and signs were taking place to the apostles. And all those who had believed were together and they had all things in common. They were selling their property and possessions and giving to anyone that might have need. Man, this is, this is a witness, right? Who wouldn't want to be a part of, of this? Is, everybody's in awe. People are coming to Christ and people are sacrificing for one another. Um, I, I waited intentionally till this portion of scripture to do this. This is the second Sunday of the month. And so the second Sunday of the month, uh, historically, is special for us here at Acts because on the first Sunday of the month, we take up an extra offering. Our leaders pray throughout the week and we ask for the Lord to reveal to us, like, God, who are we supposed to give this to? And so last week we took up that offering and today, and I think it really lines up with the scripture, we're going to give that away um, to a couple of ladies in the body of Christ. And so last week you guys gave about $1,644. And we have two checks here this morning. Uh, the first one is for $822, half of it, and 65 cents for Madeline. If you'd come on up here, yeah. Madeline Kesson. <laughs> the Lord loves you. <laughs> Amen. And the other one, the same amount, $822.66. I don't know where she's sitting, but I saw her a while ago. Elizabeth Kitchens. There you are. Yeah. Love you. All right, sorry. Man, we should just have all kinds of stuff like this in church all the time, right? Like... Like, just the beauty of the, the Spirit of God loving on us so that we can love on one another and, and, and the, allowing the Spirit of God to create something 
that people don't walk in and feel like, oh, that was terrible. But they walk in like, oh my gosh, those people are crazy. Like in a good way. In a really good way. Um, day by day. It says day by day they were, they were continuing with one mind in the temple. Can you imagine being a part of something that you don't mind getting together with these people every day? Like so many times when it comes to church stuff, we're just like, oh, man, got another church thing. You know, we got to go. That isn't what ha- that's not what's happening here. Like they couldn't wait to get together. Breaking bread from house. So they're together in the temple. Then they go to their houses and they eat their meals together. They were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God, having favor with all the people. And the Lord, the Lord, the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. Now, the verses we read obviously come after the first part of Acts chapter 2. What happened right prior to this was the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. A real, authentic, powerful baptism outpouring of the Holy Spirit resulted in these things. I believe it is the, the most pure the church has ever been. Um, it's true, you know, we cry out for revival in the church today, but I think we, what we many times are crying out for is not revival at all. It's some man-made fabrication. I think when we cry out for revival, this should be what we're crying out for. And to have this, we must experience an outpouring of the Holy Spirit because he is the one that creates it. It's not man created. It is created by him. Um, When it comes to the fruit of the Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit, I've come to see this differently than I used to see it, and I'm teaching it differently than I used to teach it. Um, I don't really believe any, I don't believe you can separate the two. I believe they're a package deal from the Holy Spirit. I don't believe we can say, I want the fruit and not the gifts, or I want the gifts and not the fruit. I mean, this is what he produces when he is allowed freedom, when he's invited in. He's producing fruit, right? The love, the joy, the peace, and he's also producing the power. It it is this that he wants to produce in the church, and is this what we just read about in Acts chapter 2 that's happening? There's the power side, the gifts of the Spirit, and then there's the fruit side, just the love and compassion for one another. And if we cry out for a real, like, authentic outpouring of the Holy Spirit, guys, I believe we're crying out for this. As we read last week in Acts chapter 1, they had been praying for a baptism of the Holy Spirit for 10 days. And then in Acts chapter 2, we see it happen. And and again, I just want to encourage you with this idea of passionate prayer. Like, just not, hey, I'm going to say a quick prayer and see what happens. But, but, man, they're praying all day, every day for 10 days. And then the result of that is, is a great outpouring. If we read on about a year later in Acts chapter 4, we see them still praying the same thing. And that's what we'll talk about this morning. Um, turn to Acts chapter 1 for just a moment. Let's, let's read these, these few portions of Scripture, and then we'll... We'll continue on. Acts chapter 1, verse 4. Let's just hear the command of Jesus. Let's just hear what he says. Remember, John the Baptist declared that Jesus would baptize in the Holy Spirit. The baptism of the Holy Spirit does not happen because of any man or any person. or, or any. It, Jesus is the one that does it. Jesus, I mean, I'm sorry, John the Baptist prophesied or declared this about Jesus. Jesus said it about himself. And then Acts chapter 1, verse 4. Gathering them together... He commanded them. It's a command, right? He commanded them, do not leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father has promised. Then he says, what what does the Father promise? It's this, which he said, you've heard from me, for John baptized you with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they came together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is that this time you're restoring the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. 
And in the light of this, you will be able to be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, even to the remotest parts of the earth. So again, guys, I just say that after being trained by Jesus, after being discipled by Jesus, how to share the gospel, how to walk in power, after being discipled by him for three years, he doesn't say, go out. He says, wait. I don't want you to do this in your own knowledge, your own training, what, you've, what your past experience even is. I want you to wait on the power of the Holy Spirit. And this is what we've got to get in our lives. It, it doesn't matter what you've done in the past. It doesn't matter your, your training. It doesn't matter. Any, it matters what today, how much are you crying out for, acknowledging, dependent upon the Spirit of God. And through this, we can be a witness. This morning, um, I want to talk about how to pray for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's not going to be a, you know, a real um, difficult thing if you're thinking, oh, I wonder what he's going to say. We're really going to get it just from Scripture. But how to pray for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Guys, what the church needs, I believe what the church needs to do more than anything else is to passionately pray for the presence of God. And this is what we're talking about. Because when the presence of God shows up, he can do things that no man can do, right? No church can do, no one. When the presence of God shows up, it changes everything. And so what we've got to do is cry out for the presence of God. Cry out for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Now, before we read the, the portion of Scripture that we're going to read, I want to read you a story. Um, this is from a biography about Billy Graham. One of the most anointed, and you know, here's a, a Baptist preacher. You may not be thinking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit when you think about Billy Graham, but trust me, you should. Um, one of the most anointed men by God, I believe, that's ever walked the face of the earth. He is believed on the conservative side that 3.2 million people have given their life to Christ through his preaching. Now, it's the Lord, right? But, but through 3.2 million for that to happen, there has to be some anointing. There has to be an outpouring upon someone of the Holy Spirit. So I'm going to read you. It's, it's a little long, but I, I want you to listen. I want to read you uh, this story from his biography. It says this. We need to understand something that happened to Billy early in his career. His biographers note that as a teenager, Billy went forward to receive Jesus Christ at an, evan at an evangelist evangelistic service in North Carolina. Then as a student at the Florida Bible Institute, he knelt and surrendered his life afresh on the 18th green of a golf course. But a few years later, he underwent a different kind of spiritual experience. During his visit to Britain in October of 1946, a meeting was arranged at Hildenborough Hall in Kent, where Billy was to was to be introduced to Christian leaders before his evangel I'm having a hard time saying this more. evangelistic tour of cities in England, Ireland, and Wales. He arrived in time for the closing service of a youth conference at which a speaker, who was Stephen Olford, um, was speaking. At the hall, Olford preached a fervent message on this text, be not drunk with wine, where is in excess, but be filled with the Spirit. And when he had finished, he seated himself and he rested his head in his hands. He became aware of someone nearby and looked up to see Billy standing over him. Mr. Olford said, Billy, I just want to ask you one question. Why didn't you give an invitation? I would have been the first one to come forward. Because you've spoken of something that I don't have. I want the fullness of the Holy Spirit in my life. Billy told his, his biographer, John Pollock, I was seeking more for more of God in my life, and I felt that here was a man who could help me. He had a dynamic, a thrill, an exhilaration about him that I wanted to capture. They arranged to meet in Wells where Billy was scheduled to preach in a town named Pontypridd. 11 miles from the home of Olford's parents. And in a room in a stone hotel in Pontypridd, Stephen and Billy spent two days together. Billy told Stephen, this is serious business. I have to learn what this is that the Lord has been teaching you. 
The first day was spent, according to Stephen, on the word and on what it really means to expose oneself to the word in quiet time. They spent the hours turning the pages of the Bible, studying passages and verses. And Billy prayed, Lord, I don't want to go on without knowing this anointing that you've given my brother. That night, Billy preached to a small crowd. And the sermon was ordinary, according to Stephen, and not the Welsh kind of preaching. Billy gave an invitation, but the response was sparse. The next day they met again, and Stephen began to, uh, concentrating on the work of the Holy Spirit by declaring, there is no Pentecost without Calvary, and that we must be broken like the Apostle Paul, who declared himself crucified with Christ. He then told Billy how God completely turned his life inside out, and it was, he said, an experience of the Holy Spirit in fullness and anointing. He explained that where the Spirit is truly Lord over the life, that there is liberty, there is release, there is freedom of complete submission of oneself in a continuous state of surrender to the indwelling of God's Holy Spirit. According to Stephen, Billy cried, Stephen, I see it. That's what I want. His eyes were filled with tears, something rare with Billy. It seems he had no appetite that day, only taking a sip of water occasionally. Stephen continued to expound the meaning of the filling of the Spirit in the life of the believer. He said it meant bowing down daily and hourly to the sovereignty of Christ and to the authority of the Word. From talking and discussing, the two men went to their knees praying and praising. And it was about mid-afternoon on the second day that Billy began pouring out his heart in a prayer of total dedication to the Lord. According to Stephen, all heaven broke loose in that dreary little room. It was like Jacob laying a hold of God and crying, Lord, I will not let you go unless you bless me. They came to a time of rest from prayer and Billy exclaimed, my heart is so flooded with the Holy Spirit. They alternately wept and laughed and Billy began walking back and forth across the room saying, I have it. I'm filled. I'm filled. This is the turning point of my life. This will revolutionize my ministry. That night, Billy was to speak at a large Baptist church nearby. And when he rose to preach, he was a man absolutely anointed. Billy's audience seemed to sense it. And they came forward to pray even before the invitation was given. Later, when it was given, Alford said the Welsh listeners jammed the aisles. There was chaos. Practically, the entire audience came rushing forward. Stephen drove back to his parents' home that night, deeply moved by Billy's authority and strength. And when I came to the door, he said, my father looked at my face and asked, what on earth has happened? He said, I sat down at the kitchen table and said, Dad, something has happened to Billy Graham. The world is going to hear from this man. He is going to make his mark in history. He was hungry First of all, he had a realization, right? He had a realization that he needed the power of the Spirit in his life. He already had the dedication. I mean, Billy already thought, man, I want to be a witness. I want to share the gospel. But he had not come to the conclusion yet that, man, I need the power of the Spirit in my life. And in this moment, he came to this conclusion, and he was filled. My first question for you this morning is, are you as hungry as he was? Do you realize your need? I mean, do, do we realize, man, we have got to be yielded, as it said, not just weekly or monthly or not a one-time experience like we talked about last week. This isn't a one-time experience, but a daily and hourly dependent dependence on the Holy Spirit. What are you willing to do about it? I want you to turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 11, verse 1, and we're going to answer the question, how to pray for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So this is the story. You guys are familiar with this. This is when the disciples asked Jesus about prayer. So why do you think they asked Jesus about prayer? I think, it's, I think it's a given. They, when, they, when he prayed, they saw something different. Like, no one prays like this. Like, he prays differently. than that, when he prays, his prayers get answered. And so they say, Jesus, let's read it, um, Luke 11, 1. It happened that while Jesus was praying in a certain place, 
after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray just as John also taught his disciples. So we see what you're doing, Jesus. Would you teach us to pray? Now, of course, the next four verses are the Lord's Prayer. But I think so many times we leave off the verses after the Lord's Prayer. So let's go to the verse 5. So he not only teaches them the Lord's Prayer, he, he tells them a parable about praying. Okay, right? So here's the teaching, here's the Lord's Prayer, now here's the parable. Verse 5. Then he said to them, Suppose one of you has a friend... And goes to him at midnight and says to him, friend, lend me three loaves. So he wants three loaves of bread. A friend of mine has come to me from a journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And from inside he answers and says, do not bother me. The door has already been shut. My children and I are in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give him anything, because he is his friend... Yet because of his persistence, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. He's saying here, he's not going to give you something just because he's your friend. He's going to give you something because you won't quit knocking on his door. So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. He who seeks, finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. Hang in there with me for the next three verses. Now, suppose one of you fathers is asked by his son for a fish. He will not give him a snake instead of a fish, will he? Or if he is asked for an egg, he will not give him a scorpion, will he? Now, listen to this, verse 13. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? So let's just look at it. The disciples say, Jesus, teach us how to pray. He tells them the Lord's Supper. Then he gives them a parable, and he, and he unpacks it in this parable. And then he ends it with, if you pray, I'm going to say the implication here, you should pray for the Holy Spirit. Of course, this makes sense with everything else we've read and Jesus taught, right? He was saying, hey, one's coming after me. Who, it's going to be better for you that I go if, if I go and that if he comes. And that's mind-blowing. What could be better than Jesus being here? But Jesus said, it's better for you. It's better for the world that I go and that the Holy Spirit comes. And so when Jesus teaches them how to pray, the one thing he tells them to pray about here is pray for the Holy Spirit. And he says, your Father will give him to you. But he doesn't say just pray in your ordinary prayer. He tells them this parable. Let's, let's break down the par- parable just a little bit. Um, There's multiple people, multiple things happen here, right? So the person knocking on the door is us, right? We are the person praying. We're crying out to God. We're knocking on the door. Um, You have the friend that has come to visit. So you're at, you're knocking on the door because your friend has come to visit. That's the world, the lost. God wants to empower us to reach the lost. So the friend's there and, and we need bread for them. There is the person that's asleep. That is the neighbor that's that's our father. That's who Jesus is saying he is. He's, he's the door we're knocking on. And it says here that he's asking for bread, but we should be doing the same thing but asking for the Holy Spirit. So we're trying to reach the lost, but we're knocking, <laughs> we're knocking on the Lord's door that we may receive the Holy Spirit, that we, have to, that we can give them what they need. Because apart from the Holy Spirit, we don't have anything to give them. So three things, real quick, easy points that we see here um, in in this parable. Number one is this. If we're going to pray for an outpouring, for a baptism, for a filling of the Spirit, guys, we have to pray with passion and pursuit. I said this last week, if you want to know a prayer that God will not answer, it is the half-hearted prayer. And the picture he's painting here is completely opposite of the half-hearted prayer. It is, it is someone that is passionate. And when I say passion, I'm not talking about how loud you get. I, I'm not talking about the words you say. I'm talking about with, with everything that's in you, is, as, as we read about Billy Graham, like, Lord, fill me with your spirit. I want to be a witness for you. Like, you, you're bought in, you're sold out, you're all in with Jesus. 2 Chronicles 16, 9 says, For the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth 
to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. If we want the strength of the Holy Spirit in our life, we've got to be fully committed. A half-hearted prayer, God will not respond to. And I believe that's what this parable is saying. It's like, man, you've got you've to ask, you've got to seek, you've got to knock, and you've got to keep coming. To ask, seek, and knock, asking would be like this. Hey, where do you live? Dennis, what's your address? Where do you live? That'd be asking that, right? So that's one thing. That's kind of, okay, I, I, I'm interested in going to see Dennis. I asked him his address. But seeking would be I get in my car and I go to Dennis's house because Dennis has something that I need. So I'm just not going to say, hey, Dennis, where do you live? I'm going to get in my car and I go to your house. But it's not enough to go to his house, right? He's saying the knocking, man, I go up to his door and I'm banging on his door at midnight. Dennis, wake up. We, uh, when we first moved into the neighborhood that we live in, and most of you guys know our story, it's a pretty rough neighborhood. And the very first year we lived there, I mean, it was almost every night, about, about midnight, we would get a bang on our door. And it was a couple that lived across the street. And, uh, man, love, love, love them. But they, when they were really struggling, they were addicted to crack. And when they would be out of money and really want to get high, he would make her go prostitute herself in the neighborhood. And then they would get high. But then when she, they, she got high, he'd get mad and he'd beat her up. So every night, they're knocking on our door, and they're wanting us to ref their fights. When we first moved into the neighborhood, I mean, we're like, hey, yeah, yeah. This was kind of you know, like, oh, we're doing ministry. This is what we're supposed to be doing. Let's, you know, let's try to help them. We realized, you know, after about six months, we quit answering the door. Unless they wouldn't stop. You know, like, man, just, honey, be quiet. Maybe they won't, they won't hear us moving around. Don't turn on any lights. Like, maybe they'll just go away. But if they just keep, Pastor Booker, wake up. They just keep yelling and hollering. And finally, you just have to go down and say, what is it? the same thing as last night. How persistent, how passionate, how much, I mean, are you, willing, are you willing to come night after night, whatever time it is? I mean, let's just do some real practical things. Are you willing to get up at midnight and just cry out to the Lord like, God, fill me with your spirit? Like, are you willing to pray for 10 days? Are you willing, what, what are you willing to do to just be anointed by God for the purposes of God? How far are you willing to go? How serious are you about being a witness? Number two, you've got to pray with persistence. Read verse eight again. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you him anything just because he's your friend, yet because of his persistence, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. How serious are you? God often waits, I believe, for our passionate persistence in prayer. And it's not that God is changed by our passionate persistence. It's that we're changed. It's that in this place of just being still, it's not, you know, I know there's some people, it's a lack of faith if you keep praying the same thing over and over. No, there's some things we should never stop praying. It's not a lack of faith. In fact, it's full of faith to trust God to be the one that's doing it. It is a constant surrender. I don't know about anybody in here, but did you surrender one time to the Lord and now you're done? You're just completely 100% obedient all the time? No, it is this daily surrender like, man, I have got to yield and surrender to you. Number three, it's very similar. Never Stop praying about it. So I shared with you last week that more than any season of my life, these last several months, I've just, I'm just praying constantly, just trying to yield and surrender to the Spirit of God. I want to be led by Him. I want to be empowered by Him. I want the fruit of the Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit and the power of the Spirit. I want to be a witness. I want to see people come. Like I'm praying that all the time. And this is, pray, by the grace of God, this has, has happened some, and it happened this last Friday. So I woke up, 
and spent my time with the Lord and just been praying to be filled with the Spirit of God. And all I can tell you is I was. Man, I was just, it feels good. Like, man, I'm just, I am full of love and power and I'm going for it. And I was, I was being a great husband. I mean, I was just, I mean, I was just, I was so much, I had so much love and power. And I was just blessing Kim like crazy. My, I felt so good. I felt so good. I'm like, I'm never going to quit being this way. Like, why would I ever want to do anything else? I'm just going to keep walking like this forever and ever. My life has been changed and nothing is ever going to stop it. And then she asked me to go put the grandkids' uh, car seat in the car. <laughs> and I went and put it in the, no, I was good. I was good. I put it in the car. I asked her where I should put it. Hey, honey, where do you want it? I'll put it where you want it. And she told me where she wanted it and went and put it in the car. But I misunderstood where she wanted it. <laughs> and I went from just so full of the Spirit to just in the biggest funk. I mean, just, I mean, I didn't, we didn't fight or it was just like, just not in a good mood, you know. <laughs> and I really believe, all joking aside, the Lord was trying to tell me that, I already said this to you last, being filled with the Spirit of God is not a one-time experience. It is not a monthly experience. It's not these five experiences throughout your life. I believe he's trying to tell me it's not even daily. It's hourly. And maybe next week it'll be, I mean, it's like, I've got to continually stay in this place. And I think, I, here's what I really, I mean, it, it sounds kind of simple, but I feel like what it should have happened. So that morning I was on my knees. I was crying out to God. God, I want to be filled by your spirit. And I just want to walk in power and love today. And I feel like he answered that prayer. And in fact, he promises in this parable that God will answer this prayer. How cool is that? You want a, you want a guaranteed answer from God? He gave us, Jesus gave us one. If we ask the Lord for the Holy Spirit, he will give it to us. Sorry, what was I saying? Um, I don't remember where I was going. Let's read a few verses. Ephesians chapter 5, Paul says, Be continually filled with the Spirit. It's an ongoing thing, right? You never stop. Fill me with your Spirit. Oh, this is what I was saying a little ago. What I should have done is in the same way that I got on my knees and cried out to be filled with the Spirit, with everything that was in me, like I, I believe there was just, God, I want to be completely led by you and surrendered. And then when this moment came that I had the opportunity not to be led and surrendered anymore, I got into the flesh, right? I believe I should have got on my knees and just cried out again. I should just, I mean, really, I think it's that practical. I think I should just, man, God, I repent. Would you just refill me with your spirit? And I'm not going to rely on any earthly tools to change my emotions. I'm going to rely on the spirit of God to change me. Acts 13, 52. And the disciples were continually filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. How often were they? Continue, which, which even the implication here is that it, that it wasn't a one-time event. Like it wasn't, but they were staying in this continual place of being yielded and surrendered to the Spirit of God, that they may be a witness for God. They were staying in this place. They were continually. It doesn't mean they don't ever mess up. It doesn't mean they don't ever get in a bad mood. It doesn't mean they won't ever sin. But they were just learning to stay in this place. I want to be yielded and surrendered to the Holy Spirit. This parable teaches, keep on asking. Keep on asking for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in your life. It says, keep on seeking. So what does that mean? Like maybe more than asking, like I'm really going to, I'm going to cry, I'm going to get people together. We're going to cry for this. I'm going to keep seeking. I'm gonna, I want to understand. I'm going to study the scriptures on it. Keep on knocking. Keep on knocking for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Like each, you know, I, I think based on this parable, it's not enough to just ask. It is, he's trying to paint a picture of like, man, I, you've got to wrap your life up in being yielded and surrendered to God. It's got to be your passion. Guys, imagine... I 
imagine what would happen. If just the people in this room decided right now, I'm fixing to change my life. I am going to begin to cry out on a continual basis to be filled with the Spirit of God, and I'm going to yield and surrender to Him. Well, then you'd have this room full of people that are, God would answer this prayer, He would pour His Spirit out. They'd walk in love and peace and grace and gentleness and good. They'd walk all these things, they'd also walk in power and they'd walk in boldness to preach the gospel. It wouldn't take much to see real revival, guys. The, the, our biggest enemy is not, I don't, I don't think our biggest enemy is our culture and the world. Our biggest enemy is the self-sufficiency of the church. Because nothing could stop the people of God surrendered to God. Like, it really, does it really matter what's happening out there if we're all yielded and surrendered to the Lord? Like, it, it can't stand against the church. So it, I, I know we have a, an enemy. And I know there are things going on. And I know we have demonic forces and we have the world. But, a, but, a, but when the people of God are yielded and surrendered to the power of God, man, nothing's going to stop that. Imagine being a part of this Acts chapter 2 church. Imagine being filled. Who doesn't want to be filled with joy and the Spirit of God continually? Man, another great part of this, and this is what I'll close with. Praise God, it is not us, it is not up to us to manufacture some moment. It is not up to us to make the baptism of the Holy Spirit happen. It is clear, as we read last week in Scripture, it is Jesus that does it. So all we have to do is be authentic. All we have to do is be passionate. All we have to do is be serious about the purposes of God and cry out to Him. Then He will pour out His Spirit afresh on us for the things that He has. Don't stand on yesterday's experience. Don't stand on your training. Be yielded and surrendered afresh, anew to the Spirit of God today. Today. Why not today? He doesn't say, like, this has to happen at certain conferences every year. He doesn't say this has to happen at some special... Man, if just the people of God will cry out to God, God will answer. So can you cry out to God today? Guys, this is how we're going to close. So, uh, I'll do short, short... Uh, I'll try to do a short explanation. Um, it is Jesus that baptized in the Holy Spirit. As we read in stories over the last few weeks, um, sometimes this happens just someone by themselves. Sometimes it happens people just crying out to God. Sometimes this happens because church leaders lay hands on people and pray for them. It is Jesus that does it, but just like Jesus is the one that heals, we lay hands and heal people. I mean, it, it's God doing it, but sometimes he, he moves when we pray for one another. Um, last week, we just cried out for it. Today, we are going to um, pray together and then given opportunities for our elders and our staff to walk among us and just lay hands on us and, and bless us and pray for us as we cry out for a fresh baptism of the Holy Spirit. So why not today? Why not today? So guys, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to pray. And if you're in here today and you're like, I want, I'm serious, I'm 100% in, I want a fresh outpouring of the Spirit in my life, I'm going to ask you to come gather around the stage. We're just going to get on our knees. If you can, if you can't get on your knees, bring your chair with you and come, just come up. Um, we're going to gather around the stage and we're just going to pray privately. God, fill us with your Spirit. And our elders and our staff are just going to walk through and they're just going to bless you and they're going to pray with you just as we see in Scripture over you for that. Um, and we're going to expect God to move and fill us afresh. So I'm again praying, and as I begin praying, if you, if that's you, it's, it ought to be all of us. If that's you, just come forward. And let's begin to pray. God, we ask for a fresh filling of your Spirit this morning.